Like the characters are great. The actors were great. The action is great. The animation is great. The writing is great. I mean, this is just a f great show. We've got another banger to discuss with you this week on Nerd Legion, guys. I know it's been a slow couple of weeks. We had to watch that terrible show, Monarch Legacy of Monsters. We, we still do. We still do. Uh, Although, can I can I break in for a second and say this, actually? I know in Korea it's a struggle for you to be able to see Godzilla minus one in theaters or anything. But if you can find any way, and I mean any way, to watch that. <laughs> Uh, not that I'm suggesting anything, but if you can find a means of watching that movie, I've seen it. It was amazing. I would love to just replace the second half of Monarch with a review of Godzilla minus Perfect. one. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm, just gonna throw I, that one I'm out not there. watching any more of Monarch. That show is trash. Uh, I'm, I'm so. fine actually not doing that too. Should we just? Is that what we're announcing here? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. This, but, okay. Well, no more Sounds Monarch. Good. No more Monarch. It was terrible. Sorry, um, Kurt Russell. No. Sorry, Kurt Russell. You weren't actually in that show enough. Uh, it turns and out Kurt they Russell's just replaced. Yeah. They just replaced you with really annoying characters that had PTSD that nobody cares about. Um, you know, it's and then too we, bad. We it's did Rebel because... Moon. <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah. One of our, probably our most negative review ever. I, 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 which was fun to watch Ed, because it was so hateable. So I enjoyed hating well, on it. It was I fun mean, it to was, hate on. It was too boring to be bad good, though. That's <laughs> that's the problem. You know, that bad movies have to have something that does kind of catch you to get you to keep watching, like Birdemic, The Room, those those mega classic bad movies, right? But, like, uh, this did not... Rebel Moon did not have it. But I want to say one more thing about Monarch Legacy of Monsters okay. before we leave it, uh, you know, in, to the mysteries of time forever, uh, is that I had a really great plan on how to... Uh, how to demonstrate that Monarch Legacy of Monsters and the Fast and the Furious franchise actually occur in the same universe. But I guess I'll have to save that for a different show now. I, I have a lot of evidence. I, I worked hard on but you know, I'm sure we're going to get another opportunity. Fast X2 is coming out next year or this year, I guess. You know, Vin Diesel, and they can't call it uh, Fast 11? Know. No, because X ended on a cliffhanger. So oh. we got to do X2. But the problem is, the last time there was an X2 was Final Fantasy X2, where all the characters just became pop stars. I, I was so, going to ask. <laughs> are we going to have the Fast and the Furious you know, cast all become pop stars in Fast <laughs> X2? I feel like they're obligated. <laughs> I that want game to was terrible. That. As somebody who, <laughs> as a teenager, played Final Fantasy X and then attempted yeah. to play Final Fantasy X 2, I was extremely disappointed in what they did what nonsensically the with the, the second game. What was that song? No, don't. It's like, what do you what do you want from me or something? I'm trying to remember <laughs> it now, but it was it was stuck in my head for like a lot of years, a lot of years. I, I, I don't understand. Try to bring it back. I do. I do approve of them doing that to the Fast and Furious franchise, <laughs> however, because I don't care about that franchise. So the amusement there would be great for me. One of the anyway. greatest film franchise of all time. But let's talk about Blue Eyed Samurai, I suppose. I yeah, suppose. Blue, Blue Eyed Samurai is uh, a lot of you have probably already seen this. I know there's been a lot of buzz, uh, but we will say that this show is extremely good. Uh, it was great to see this after Scavenger's Reign. Um, the the adult animation definitely thriving at the current time. Um, not I'm going to say not an anime, this show, because it was actually no. produced by a French animation studio and then doesn't look like anime, even though it has some of the kind of over-the-top anime style combat and violence. But a lot of that was derived from Kurosawa's films, and so it wasn't original to anime. It was more about the film medium as a whole in Japan and the way that they do action sequences. Yeah, I mean, you know, they don't have a monopoly on over-the-top violence. I mean, Monty Python, right? We've had that, you know, for a while. So it's like there's there's lots of examples of that in other, sure. other mediums, other animation. But, it's, but it's I mean, there, not... there, are, there are elements of, like, ninja school. Yeah to this for sure well sure, you know a, sure. a lot of those um a lot of those really violent 90s anime uh berserk. films yeah berserk um akira like a, a lot of that does have vibes there's vibes of that for sure in this my neighbor totoro maybe not maybe not that, but, you know. princess mononoke i don't know anyway um I, it's i got this 
speaking of the animation, I got this this weird like uh, Disney vibe when I was watching it in like a good way. But uh, the way that the the way the characters were drawn, the way that their you know faces and mouths moved during dialogue, the way their hands moved. Um, just the way a lot of the shots were constructed, like a lot of times I, I had to like catch myself and be like, okay, I'm not actually watching a Disney movie made for grownups. I'm watching like a different thing, but I, it really did just, and, and I'm, that's, that's a compliment because I always really loved the Disney 2D animation. I'm very sad that it's apparently just gone now. Um, but, uh, this really kind of reminded me of that. Obviously, you know, it's, it's 3d, right? This is, this is similar to arcane. If you've seen that where it's, it's a sort of like a modified, uh, CG essentially where it's, it's try, they try to give it this more painterly quality. I don't think anyone's done it quite as well as arcane yet, but this, this came fairly close. I think there was a lot of good imagery. And again, I really love the way that they drew their characters faces specifically. Um, and then, you know, did emotion, did dialogue with that. It was very, very Disney and, and very, very cool. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think the animation is extraordinary. It does, I will say, I think you have to, it takes a few minutes to kind of like buy into it because the more sure. 3D looking models on the more 2D backgrounds, definitely you 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 kind of have to acclimate yourself to the style. But I found it pretty unnoticeable past the, the 10 minute mark. Like once I was kind of bought into the aesthetic, uh, it was yeah. just great. And I think the level of detail and the level of money that went into this is crazy. Uh, the quality of the, the you know, you, there's a big difference here. Like Scavenger's Reign was its own thing, but you could clearly tell that they were making the most out of a smaller budget. This mm. is Netflix, like, splashing out. I mean, the backgrounds are gorgeous. The fight sequences are gorgeous. The character design and, and like, the, the expressiveness and the detail is gorgeous. It is an immense amount of resources went into making this show. And it really shows. It really shows. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes, it kind of goes back to that arcane thing again, where I feel like it scratches that itch, you know, of this, uh, you know, darker, uh, more adult oriented animated, you know, series. And it's coming out at a perfect time, right? Because uh, Arcane was, what, like a little over a year ago now. Um, we know Arcane Season 2 is coming out later this year, I think, much later this year. So this kind of helps bridge that gap if if you're looking for that specific kind of thing. Um, this is very different from Arcane in a lot of ways. But I think it does scratch that itch of, you know, animation styles that you want to watch, of kind of a darker storyline um i i will say i did have some complaints about this series we'll we'll get into over the course but in in general i i really did enjoy watching it and i i would have watched another eight episodes like it was it was hard to stop once once i started once i got into it you know well they've already actually rolled out you know plans for a season two netflix has committed to doing that and yeah. um the, yeah. cr the creators have said that there's enough material probably for three or four seasons and this is wow. created by mike Michael Green, um, who is an American writer uh, for screenplays, and he has actually done a lot of interesting stuff. It's also made by him and his wife, um, Amber Noizumi, who, based on her name, I assume is Japanese, <laughs> right? Um, which like which Japanese makes name. sense, which makes sense given uh, the creative direction of this show. But uh, mm -hmm. Michael Green actually like wrote the screenplays for Logan, which makes a lot of sense oh, when you think about okay. the kind of like yeah. dark, uh, more psychologically, um, you know, dark action, like v very violent action movies. Someone that can take a like insane amount of punishment and, yes. and still keep fighting. Yeah, that, that does <laughs> it, remind it, me of Logan, yeah. It <laughs> makes more sense in Logan because of the powers of Wolverine than the yeah. incredibly unrealistic amount of damage that Mizu, the main character in the show can take. <laughs> doesn't end until you die but i mean Seriously. You, it's it's just, it's just part of the it's part of the vibe of it right like yeah, this is, is this is over the top uh you know it, it, that's why you watch it right is because you yeah. know it's unrealistic um but he also did blade runner 2049 and then interestingly oh. he did um the latest kenneth Branagh 
uh, adaptations of um, Agatha Christie. So he did Murder on the Orient yeah. Express. Um, the Venice one that just came out. Yeah, he did Death on the Nile, and then he did A Haunting in Venice. I haven't seen A Haunting in Venice, but the other two were very good. And I've read the other the Agatha Christie books as well. Hmm. He's also apparently writing the Bioshock movie. Oh, all right. That um, sounds Perfect for him, based on uh, what we know he's done in the past. <laughs> yeah. uh, I yeah. would like it to be Bioshock Infinite. I know they're gonna not going to start with Infinite, but I that know, is one too. of my favorite games of all time. Like that's I a, know, that's, me a too. that's a whole different podcast. We'll have to do that sometime. But yeah. So he's currently Netflix. He's currently uh, working on the Bioshock movie for Netflix. Um, that's so exciting. that's that's really interesting. And also, by the way, this makes sense as to why Kenneth Branagh is one of the voices in this show because he works with Kenneth Branagh on the uh, Hercule Poirot mysteries, so the three movies that he's done over there, because those yeah. are, of course, starring Kenneth Branagh, right? And um, can we talk about Kenneth Branagh for a second and how, uh, like, awesome he was in this? Like, his I, his, his voice work was was great. I, I love the way he did this character because it wasn't just... He was, he was very evil, but he wasn't just, like, mustache twirlingly evil. He was sort of, like, a casual extreme evil, which is, I always thought, almost scarier right yeah where someone isn't they're not evil and like they're not like the emperor in star wars where they're just like this megalomaniac and gleefully evil they're evil in a very almost like apathetic way where they don't even they don't even care or seem to grasp the level of depravity that they're that they're you know kind of bringing into the world and i mean i feel like that's much more frightening so the fact that he was able to bring all that into the character like it, it was great voice work you came all this way for me because of what I just may be to you. <laughs> Maybe. I thought I accounted for all my bastards over the years. They lined the tunnel you came in. All those half-breeds like you. All yeah, across and the board, but he in I, particular stood out. Yeah, and I think if you've watched the the Hercule Poirot uh, movies, um, you would know, like, his accent work is crazy because he's playing a Belgian character. He's a, he, he, you know, he's an English-speaking actor. He's playing a Belgian character. His Hercule Poirot accent, he nails it. And I will say this is... I've those and I've not gotten around. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. Also, just as an aside, I knew, you know, he was going to be great at voice acting in this because if you guys want a treat, you can go and download the audiobooks that he's narrated. So not only did oh. he do the films, but actually the audiobooks of like Death on the Nile, he does he he does the narration for the Agatha Christie uh, audiobooks. And what's so crazy when you listen to that is because there are characters from all over the world, right? So you have English characters, Belgian characters, uh, American characters. I don't know if he did all, this all in one take. But the fact that he flips to so many different accents over the course of, you know, a few pages of dialogue is really, really amazing to listen to. Um, it's probably the best narrated audiobook I have ever heard. And so if you want a treat, you guys can go listen to to Kenneth Branagh reading those books uh, if you have a commute have or something to, like that. I'll have to do that. I'm I'm new to audiobooks. I always thought like that I would never be able to focus on them enough. But uh, it turns out when I'm driving, I, I can actually <laughs> do audiobooks. So when I've been driving around uh, over the last like couple of years, I've been doing audiobooks. And now I'm doing the, the Joe Abercrombie uh first law trilogy right now or first law series i'm into the second book of that and the the voice actor they've got for that is extremely good or narrator i should say so i'll have to do that because yeah i'm i'm actually coincidentally i'm very into audiobooks right now it's, <laughs> it's neat you know there you go um yeah. and i i do think it's interesting because i think some people might complain that kenneth brana he his accent is kind of strange in this show in that it's it's like a hybrid sometimes he sounds a little bit more scottish sometimes he he is an irish character in this show mm. um you know sometimes he sounds a little bit more irish sometimes he sounds a little bit more british but that will all be very deliberate on kenneth brana's part like it's it's kind of it it's what makes this character unique because it's like he invented a hybridized accent specifically for this abijah fowler character if you might my dear dear friend my trusted partner and clear Equal my right hand and both feet on land. Fondest heart, spare a cup of concern towards our purpose. And do it your fucking self. Right, well, I mean, it's this takes place in the 1600s. So, you know, the the Irish accent that we would hear, you know, today, obviously, is very different than we would hear from an Irish person in the 1600s. 
you add into that that in theory everyone in the show is actually speaking japanese but we just hear it in english sure. because you know we need yeah, yeah, too yeah. so <laughs> you know and this character is just a he's a very like you know clearly damaged human being and so you know sometimes that can come out in you know cadence and how you speak uh, tone things like that so i feel like that was inserted as well to sort of make him a little bit even more off settling than just a standard you know well-spoken accent right he added this kind of like weird lilt to it that again like makes it a little bit a little bit creepier to listen to the characters so i, yeah, I love that yeah. yeah the accent is just so unique and i i feel like it's very iconic you know it sounds so weird when you first hear it but then by the end of the show like i think it adds so much dimension to the character so let's talk about totally, what this totally. show is because we're, <laughs> we're we're kind of deep in here so for those of you who have been waiting many of you have probably already seen this but blue eye samurai is a show that um, is set, as Doha pointed out, in the 1600 period. So it's it's part of what was in Japanese history, the Tokugawa shogunate, which was a period of political stability after a lot of fighting amongst all of the daimyo in previous centuries for basically military control of Japan. So at this point in time, the Tokugawa family has taken over and centralized power as the shogun. And the emperor is more or less a figurehead that is controlled by the shogun during this time period. And this period uh, starts in the 16 at, at around 1600 and then goes until the middle of the 19th century. So like I think it's 1868 when the Meiji Restoration occurs. And that's mm -hmm. when the emperor is um, kind of returned to power at that point in time. But this is a period of relative political stability. It's an isolationist period from Japan. So at this point in time, they did historically allow some level of trade, but they put all of primarily the Dutch, as I understand it, on an island and then with like a bridge to it and wouldn't let any of them off the island. Um, so they didn't want any kind of, you know, Christian missionary work because they found it disruptive to their society. They wanted to control the flow of goods um, so that they would maintain their Japanese-ness. Um, and so during this time, since very early in this time, they had really clamped down uh, very hard uh, on, you know, Western uh, interaction. So the main character of this show is a half Japanese, half white. We don't know what what kind of white, uh, you know, where her other parents is from, because the whole point of this show is that the main character, a woman named Mizu, who pretends to be a man so she can be a samurai and have more freedom in society, um, is trying to hunt down her parents uh, or her father basically. And so she's targeting all of the remaining white people that she knows in Japan. Kenneth Branagh plays Abijah Fowler, who is one of these characters who is being kept um, in order to maintain some trade links with the West and provide uh, firearms effectively for the Shogun. But even though the Shogun has banned Western people in Japan, he keeps Fowler on his little castle in on an island in the ocean so that he can maintain some links and pot, you know, beneficial trade to him to the West. Um, major, so, uh, major Dante's Inferno reference, by the way, there. <laughs> so he's on the ninth level of a castle in yes. a frozen uh, lake. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for Not sure. Uh, there's there's so <laughs> many references. There's like a bazillion references in this show to everything yeah. else. I mean, there's call outs to kill Bill uh, at times, you know. I mean, it's more than a call out. Like they, that's okay. We'll we'll get into the music. We'll get, later. Okay, so that's, that's so one anyway, of my own specific with this show. But please continue. Yes, the the storyline is basically that um, the the Mizu, the main character, she is persecuted because she is half white. She's very obviously half white because she has blue eyes, which would genetically be very really unlikely, rare. very yeah. unlikely to happen <laughs> between a white person and an Asian person as. We know because we are, Doe and I are people with kids who are half Asian and, you know, yes. 
No blue eyes, even though we both have blue eyes. <laughs> Although I do know one of my college professors had a had a he married a Korean woman uh, and have a daughter who has green eyes. So it it you know the genetics are out there. Yeah, sure. It's just uh, it's it's very rare. Um, but anyway, uh, we will suspend our disbelief because it's a cool part of the story, and she spends a lot of yeah. time like hiding her eyes behind colored glasses so that people can't tell, and that it's it functions well within the show because it's an, an immediate um, indicator of her otherness effectively mm -hmm. so she as a child is persecuted by other people within her village she is constantly under the pressure of perhaps dying she is viewed very negatively by the other people within uh, the japanese society that she finds herself in and so she is kind of an she is orphaned and has to go basically live with a sword a blind swordsmith so obviously he can't tell that she is female or that she is half white um apprentices with this master swordsmith and then uh trains in order to as an adult be able to enact her story of revenge which is most of the show where she is ostensibly the best martial artist now in japan and is on the warpath hunting for fowler to kill him and discover who her father is mm. yeah it's a it's a you know not uh it's it's not the most typical revenge story but it, it is typical in function that it's just a character that will kill their way through whatever they need to kill their way through to get to the person they want to kill so it it does have a fairly generic premise in that regard but uh, and it doesn't really stray from that but some of the things that happen the way in which it unfolds uh helps make it a little bit more unique um, so I'll, I'll forgive it for that, but there's nothing wrong with a story that's been told before, as long as it's told well, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I will yeah. say that I was concerned at first because this show is extremely derivative of many, many different things. Like when you get the sense of when you start watching this show, you get the sense of, oh, I've seen this before. And it takes yeah. until you kind of get to episode five before it starts to be really unique and interesting. So the groundwork and the structure of the show is not incredible in and of itself, right? If you are well versed in film history or, you know, you've you've seen a lot of these kind of TV shows that it derives from, you're not mm -hmm. going to be particularly surprised like there there's a bunch of elements of, first off it derives a huge amount from kurosawa films obviously yeah. you know visually um in terms of the characters um you know bizu is is similar to you know the main character in yojimbo played by toshiro mifune kind of a, wow. a, a stoic badass in a lot of ways there's um, you know i, I I mean, more recently, there. This is this is almost just a retelling of Kill Bill. It's yes. it's it's close enough that I will say it is almost like a Kill Bill remake, basically, <laughs> to the extent that the main character is referred to as the bride in a, a large part of of one episode. So it's so yes. it's like you know, and they use the Kill Bill theme at the end of episode one, which I hated. So by the way. technically, but, that uh, came from yeah. another movie, and Quentin Tarantino took that. Uh, from another film like so this is actually it's still been used like in a variety of films however i will say that the da, 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 that is so iconically associated with an english-speaking audience with kill bill right now that it's impossible mm -hmm. to, to not feel the kill billness of it yeah i certainly did and and the i didn't have as much of a problem with that song that's a that's a fine track you know but that and then like using for whom the bell tolls and all that kind of stuff later on the series like when and where they chose to just suddenly throw in modern music um i was not a fan yeah, of but, at all but it you took see me out of it immediately I, so that is one thing with the show that i absolutely hated was the use that, of modern music me back in the dungeon but it, was, it it's it a, not it, done well it does feel like a samurai champloo reference though in no in but certain samurai ways Champlu was all new javas that was all like lo-fi uh hip-hop kind of but stuff. i'm just it saying really... the inclusion of modern music right. in the samurai epic does well, feel a, lot a of bit done that but sure this, the the difference is is that this show 
presents itself itself as one that will be very orchestral and stay that way and then just randomly goes into this so it's like they felt they needed to do that because of what you're talking about but they really didn't need to do that and and the way they chose to do it i felt like was very abrasive um tonally so yeah i, I agree it also with what you're saying i just also... think they didn't do it well in this show it also wasn't consistent because Metallica yeah. is very different than the I think the the track is called Battle Without Honor or Humanity. I think that's the the name of the track. Yeah, uh, like that. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, that is very different stylistically than having a Japanese language version of For Whom the Bell Tolls. I agree that some of this mm -hmm. did feel a little bit out out of there. But there's there's yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of other you know aspects of this. Like it, it's it's so this feels like a lovingly crafted pan like panache of different aspects of Japanese cinema and you yeah. know western cinema as well like you definitely because of the blind um you know the blind master you definitely get like zatoichi vibes from the the blind samurai uh moments you do get and it's it also with zatoichi too the kind of like over the top uh martial prowess of the main character because what happens is that Mizu just becomes like this singularly skilled sword fighter who's able to take on armies of people all at the same time, which makes the show very great. exciting, which is great. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the, yeah. the best things about it. I love um, Goku. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it we does, have a Goku it, and a Vegeta in this show too, which is uh, which we can get into a little bit later. But yeah, yeah that's so fine. I, it's great. there's yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of tropes uh, that you will have seen before. But I yeah. think what makes it so interesting is that the way that it weaves all these tropes together becomes quite surprising by the end. And Mizu's character has a shocking amount of depth. Uh, by the time we get to episode five and we get to some of the backstory stuff, which again does have certainly, certainly, certainly has the Kill Bill elements to it because of the mm -hmm. female protagonist, the difference between the female protagonist's, um, you know, role that she wants to be to live versus the expected role of being, you know, a wife within a marriage. Like, it definitely toys with that in the same way that, that Kill Bill does. Um, and I think this, in many ways, is much more successful than Kill Bill. I think this is a better iteration. Yeah, I actually, I, I would say I like this better than Kill Bill. Uh, Kill Bill was like, it's, you know, it was, it was fun, but I felt like it, it was, you know, and, and I'm not a, I, I know this is unpopular, but I've never been a big Quentin Tarantino fan. I'm just, he's hit just not my me. thing. It's just not my thing. But like, uh, but with, with this, I, I think one thing we need to talk about early on is our last episode was complaining the entire time about how Rebel Moon was so derivative. Now we watch this, which is almost equally as derivative, and yet we have nothing but glowing praise. Well, not nothing, but but lots of glowing praise for it. And I will tell you, in my opinion, what the difference is between Rebel Moon and between this is that the characters are actually good. <laughs> yeah. Like none the of, characters none are all of great. the characters in Rebel Moon were good. They were all cookie cutter. They were all boring. They were all uh mashed together we never got really a good sense of backstory or motivation really for those whereas this show and you know what do you know rebel moon was a two hour ish film this was an eight episode series <laughs> hey guess what a format in which we can flesh out a bigger kind of ensemble cast like this you do get better characters and you do get more backstory and stuff like that so again i'll say rebel moon should have been a series but that's neither here nor there this show had great characters um not just in that they had interesting backstories, but they had interesting development as the series went on um, in sometimes satisfyingly expected ways and in sometimes very unexpected ways too. Um, but this, this show just was, it totally nailed it character development wise. They were all interesting from the very beginning and then they got more interesting both from the revealed backstory and what happened to them as the journey kind of went along. So that I think is a big difference between this and Rebel Moon is that they both draw a lot from other things, but this does it with very good characters that are ultimately, you know, I think the most important thing in, in any medium, right? The characters are really what, what makes a story, you know? And, and just from a, a writing perspective too, I think this is one of, I think episode, I keep coming back to episode five because episode five, I think is one of the best crafted from it, from a writing standpoint, character backstory reveals that i have ever seen like it, that, that is that episode is so fucking good um it was funny on its own I, 
in my one of my my main note for that episode was maybe one of the greatest backstory episodes ever. <laughs> it it's, is. Uh, word, word for word. It, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Because you have a crystal clear idea of what Mizu is all about at the end of that one, and and the way they present it is just it's just beautiful. Well, it's, it's that it's, is a great episode. I I think we should just dive into that because we're gonna have to pick sure. just a few good things about this show to discuss. And again, yeah. we strongly encourage everybody to go watch this. It's a very very good show. Um, but what I loved about that is it's not just that you get, so the, the format of the episode is this, we are, we are now exploring Mizu's backstory when she was married to a kind of exiled samurai. So a, a, what is a, a guy who's effectively a Ronin, right? And the way that this is told is in an interspersed narrative, um, where Mizu is trying to protect this brothel from a, a crime lord we weren't we we're not going to get into why so it's it's in the middle of an action sequence um uh, that has taken place in this like dark brothel and it is a very cool action sequence so she's kind of skulking around trying to take out these these criminal hitmen who have been sent into this brothel it's like a hundred of them too by the way yeah and she's yeah. she's injured and kind of having like feverish injury flashbacks um and then on top of that, there is an, a Bunraku performance that is being played out. So Bunraku is traditional Japanese puppetry. So this is a it, it's a it's a a play done with traditional puppets, and the play is about a Ronin and his wife, and it, the Ronin is on a quest for revenge. Um, and so all of this is then cut back to her own wedding. Where she is already a badass, uh, she's already a badass character, you know, a badass warrior. And in order to kind of save her mother, um, she is paired off with this disgraced samurai. And I think what's so genius about this, Doa, is that in the frame narrative of the Bunraku play, you are supposed to at first think that she is the Ronin, but it, by the end of the play, it turns out that the Ronin kills his wife and his wife becomes an Onryo, which is like a hungry ghost, right? A vengeful spirit, basically, in Japanese mythology. Mm. And you find out that it was actually the wife who is supposed to be the analog character to Mizu. And so they, they really play with your expectations. Because by interweaving these narratives, you're supposed to think, oh, Mizu is supposed to be like the Ronin character in the play. But then by the end, you figure out, oh, no, she's supposed to be the wife, like the vengeful spirit character. And I thought that was such a fucking great twist um, where it completely subverts your expectations about how the play is used as an allegory for Mizu's situation. Yeah, I I really appreciated it for the way it sort of explained her sort of extreme coldness and brutality that we saw in earlier episodes where, you know, she was like, you know, leaving people to starve, all this kind of stuff, like really didn't care about anybody that didn't, you know, help her fulfill her mission of, of going and killing the people that her she's after to like a degree where you're like, Oh, it's hard to root for this person. But then we hear about her whole backstory and we just see, just how brutal it was and how bleak it was. And you do see how that would break a person down to become the person that she has become too. So that fixed the character in a way that I think it kind of needed at that point in the series a little bit. Um, and then I, the, the very end of the episode, I really like too, where it reveals that uh, Amiko or did I get the name right. Akemi, right. Akemi uh, is in the Shogun's palace. And with that also at that point tells you that like, her whole thing was not getting there was that she didn't want to go there. And the last thing it's like, Oh, she did get there anyway. So that was kind of a, a, another down note on top of down notes well, at the end. So the whole episode but, is just like, uh, very bleak, bleak than a Minnesota bleak, but, winter. <laughs> but you, you, you get to see exactly the kind of, you know, why, uh, Mizu makes the decision because at the end of the episode, yeah. Mizu has the opportunity to prevent Akemi from being taken away. And Akemi just helped yep. her live yep. basically through this brothel raid. Uh, and she's like, no, just take her away. I don't give a fuck. The only thing I care about is revenge. And yep. in an, in isolation, that moment might feel like kind of unreasonably cruel, but because we just saw the whole backstory and what we realize what happens to Mizu is that she does actually fall in love slowly with the man that she's with. And, but at the end, 
uh, when she reveals that she is a better warrior than him, he is kind of emasculated. And then there's an open what's so crazy about this episode is there's just an open question about yeah. whether her husband betrayed her half white origins uh, to the Lord that he used to serve under to get back into his good graces after being disgraced and cast out for reasons that we don't know. Um, you know, we don't know whether when the men are sent to kill her and she kills them instead and her husband rides away on the horse, is he afraid of being killed himself? Or did he try and organize basically the assassination of his own wife? And in the end, she just ends up killing him. So, yeah, well, I mean, grim. you have to, you, you add on to this that her mother's been living with them the entire time and her mother's been struggling with, with opium addiction. Um, and then at the end of the episode, like, uh, you know, he blames her Well, uh, Mises husband blames her mom that she sold them out for money for opium because the two of them were trying to get her to quit, you know, and the way that mother character is developed, like you believe that she would possibly do that at that yep. point in the story, too. So you don't know if it's her husband or her mom who ends up betraying her and you never find out because the husband or if it was something else early. entirely. Right, right. The husband's quarreling with the mom, and he kills the mom, and then Mizu kills him. So both of the people are dead. She'll never know. She just knows that you know she was betrayed by the two people she arguably trusted, you know, the most. I am your mother, your mother. Mizu. He stood by to watch them kill you. He's dishonorable, weak. Shut your mouth, you lying whore. Uh, uh, he's hurting me. Stop it! Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't get any worse really for somebody than it did for for poor Mizu there. And so then you know when you see the uh, the rest of the episode, Nakemi is you know just kind of discarded. You're like, well, yeah, that's what that's what uh, you know Mizu is kind of used to. You know, that's just well, been her life, right? So. I mean, you also have to think about it in context too because. You know, what Mizu sees in Akemi, who is, you know, the daughter of a, a powerful daimyo who's going yeah. to get married to one of the sons of the shogun, is basically a life of privilege without yeah. any kind of worry whatsoever. Meanwhile, Mizu has been persecuted her entire existence, was an orphan. And so it's easy to understand why she just doesn't give a fuck about what happens to Akemi, because the worst case scenario is like a dream life for most people in feudal Japan, right? Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. in some ways, I think, you know, Akemi's privilege does make it hard to have sympathy for her as a character, even though she is in a, a situation where she is being forced into a marriage that she doesn't particularly want and is actively trying yeah. to run away from it. Right. It's she not that you don't have sympathy to a certain extent. Yes. Yeah. I mean, to the maximum extent she's spoiled to the, yeah. the she's spoiled to the extent it was possible to be spoiled in feudal Japan. The maximum not that amount. she doesn't. <laughs> no, not that she doesn't have a valid right to, you know, not want not. to be married off to someone. Yeah, of course. No, like they you make know, her a sympathetic character, but I think you could understand. Same time. Yeah. Like things Mizu, are much worse for other people. Right. Yeah. And I think what's so heartbreaking about Mizu's backstory is that you realize that she had been this outcast. She hadn't been accepted. And then as she is developing a relationship with what appears to be a good man who's very sympathetic, is not like forcing himself sexually on her in a way that would have been acceptable at that time, uh, one would assume. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been very patient with her and she genuinely starts to love him. And you see that relationship to, to develop. This is the one thing that you feel like outside of her relationship with the, uh, the swordsmith that has gone well in her life. And what's so stark is that this show does an excellent job of just showing what two paths would have looked like. Like had these events not occurred with the possible betrayal by her mother or husband, or, you know, we don't even know, like they could have just found out who she was and sent troops all on their own. Like it's never clear Possibly and she too. never knows uh, what yeah. the actual outcome is, but you see this really stark, these two paths, one of which would have been her living potentially a kind of normal, happy life and giving up on the revenge and not using these phenomenal skills that she's trained with. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, she just gets the worst possible hand dealt with her. And for the first time when she's feeling kind of like safe in a relationship, it, it, she suffers betrayal. So how do you trust anybody? At that point in yeah. time, right? Mm -hmm. How do you care about anything? And I think that 
that makes her motivation just incredibly crystal clear and does wonders, I think, for the emotional weight of this show. It's just really well written. Yeah. I, you know, I do one minor complaint, and maybe this is a subjective thing, but I do feel like we get to the end of the series with her and and her character hasn't really learned a lot. She's still pushing people away. In the end, you know, she chooses her, you know, mission of revenge, um, even though it's been kind of demonstrated that like that's not that's not all, you know. I I wasn't uh, you know, just I to, disagree. To jump right. Yeah, okay. Go I ahead. disagree. So first off, um she doesn't actually go through with her mission of revenge because she chooses to save Tygen when she gets into Fowler's castle instead of killing Fowler. Um, well, I think that was more because she knew neither of them stood a chance at that moment. I think that was more like, okay, it's not going to work out this time. I'll come back later kind of situation. I, I disagree. I disagree because I think that she, everything that we had seen up until that point in time is that she's willing to die in order to, enact the revenge and the way they present her character is she always wants to charge in through the front door she always wants the most direct approach she's not going to waste any time so why would she waste time trying to get to you know trying to get there again i think she willfully makes a decision to save tygen rather than kill fowler um and i i don't know if that was giving up on on the revenge aspect of it's things. Not, so i feel uh, like that was more of a strategic move still but I, I, I think, disagree. I think, I think, I think she... humanity, I think and they had to give her little sparks of humanity here and there to, you know, again, try to suggest a little bit of like growth. But, the, you know, again, like there's a there's a very tragic element in this whole story. Right. And and one of the ways to develop tragedy is to give you like little sparks of hope that the character can kind of like break free of this shadow that seems to be sort of, you know, clinging to them, you know. And, and so when little things like that happen, you know, you have hope for for Mizu. Right. But then in the end, you know, she still kind of discards everybody and, and goes off on a revenge, you know, quest anyway. So it's like, well, you know, it's it's a the, she's still a good character. I'm not saying that she's a bad character. I'm just saying I would have liked a little bit more uh, positive development rather than just tragedy, you know, for her. I, I think that the but like payoff... I said, it might be subjective. It might be subjective. I think the payoff of her character arc is this is a realistic amount of change. I think that you see in the show. And I think that because we know that this show is going to get future seasons, I think that the slower and more intricate the character development of Mizu is, the bigger the payoff is going to be in the end. Because if I it like, does end up going that far, yeah. Mm -hmm. I but I you know, instead of just blowing your load and having a, a very unrealistic turnaround based off of her incredibly traumatic history. I think it's much better to show the little things like, oh, she is going to prioritize saving Tygen in this moment. She is going to slowly warm up to Ringo, right? Mm. Because it takes many episodes of Ringo, this character following her around, wanting to basically be her squire, uh, right? To to apprentice under her, to help her in her mission. Um, you know, it does take time for Ringo's actions and words to be accepted by her and she is affected when Ringo kind of calls her out for acting without honor and leaves she does think about yeah. that and there's some I think that if Ringo doesn't have that moment perhaps she doesn't choose to save Tygen in the end right so I think we're Possibly. starting to see you know very slow and deliberate growth which is I think realistic to her situation because it's going to take a long time to kind of crack through all of the trauma that she has had. And so it has mm -hmm. to be portrayed in a very slow moving iterative fashion for this character to come across as emotionally realistic. You are no samurai. A samurai is honorable. I never said I was a samurai. You did. I'm on the path of revenge. There's no place on it for love or friendship or weakness. I agree with you uh, to the to the extent that I think if you if you say here's our character and here's our situation we're going to give them X amount of things to start to move them into a positive direction from that situation uh, if you want to have a tragic setback for that character I don't think at the end of your season you take all of those things away. Uh, you take you can take some of them but leave them like one or two things right. Because I feel like the character that, you know, goes on the boat at the end of the, the season 
is kind of the the you know same character we got in episode one, right? Because they had they gave her all those little moments and things, and then she just discards every single one of them towards the end, right? Bad relationship with with everybody that she had started to develop a good relationship with. If we would have gotten like one or two of those little things to stick, you know, I feel like that would have. That's that's I that's kind of how you want progressive tragedy to go in my mind is you give them a bunch of things you take most away you let them keep a little bit and I don't think let I don't think they let her keep anything which is where I have uh, my my issue with it again it's it's I will admit this is subjective this is maybe me wanting to write it in my own you know way but I feel like that's a better way where you still feel like there's a little win there, you know, it's the end of a season, but you still have the tragedy of taking most of the progression away. I, I just think it's too early to tell because by the end, she is theoretically on a boat going to London to hunt down the other two members, you know, the other two of the four white people that were in Japan um, with Fowler's help. And I thought until they were still in Japan up until that point. No, they went back to London. So I think the next season is going to be her in England, actually. Yeah, I mean, during that, during the series, I was actually thinking, oh, it'd be cool if she actually went to Europe, you know, and, yes. and you know, connected with, you know, the, you know, another part of her background, you know, but, uh, and, and had adventures there. So I'm glad that's happening. The way in which it was done is another thing that I'm like a little bit uh, about where it's like, she's about to kill him. And then he says all this stuff and she just believes him. It's like... She's taken a lot on faith from this guy who's kind of been the big bad for the entire season. So I I did have a little bit of an issue with that, where there wasn't really any evidence given that any of what he was saying was true, besides him just saying it. So that's another thing where it's like she, you know, she discards all of the positives she's built up over the season. She just completely believes the bad guy when she's about to kill him. It just goes <laughs> off on a boat with him. I'm like... All right, that's a that's I'm not a hundred percent cool with that. Well, I get that you wanted her to go to London, but I feel like we could have gotten there in a, a little bit better of a way. There's so much you don't know. Scaffington Rightly. You wanna find them? You need me alive. That's that's fair. But I, I also think she didn't have any other leads and they need to move the story along. And it's not so clearly, shitty. Clearly. Yeah, it's not yeah. so shitty that I found it unbelievable. Um, it's a, and also, it's a nitpick, but, yeah. I, you know, I think the thing about the production of these Netflix shows is that you may not have as many, re even though this is clearly a very high budget production, you may not have as many resources as you like in the first season. And I think that this show has been such a success that maybe you get more resources in order to build out the show to make it longer or to do, to do different things in subsequent seasons. Um, because by renewing it, I think it's clear they have a lot of faith and are going to prioritize producing more Blue Eye Samurai. And I think perhaps this could have been a casualty of maybe not having the, the runtime on the show that the writers would have liked in the first place. Possibly, yeah, yeah, that that is possible. I just saw again the way they got there was a little bit was a little bit unbelievable considering everything that character had been through. Um, but speaking of characters, uh, how about how about Tygen? He was he's a great character because he's you know he starts out as like the bully that grew up and he's and he's still a bully, but then he gets totally humiliated in the first episode, and <laughs> and you can see that there's that you know there's some there's a little bit of change going on that maybe like his nature isn't to be as much of a bully as, as, you know, he was maybe, uh, you know, forced through, you know, peer pressure, culture, whatever to be up to that point, you know? And so I, I feel like there was some development there, you know, both him and Akemi are kind of like ignorant young, young lovers <laughs> to a certain extent where they're like, yeah. Oh, I'm just pining for the other one. And, and then in the end, they kind of find out that like, that's, uh, that's a bit childish, you know, but I, I do like seeing this character sort of like grow up and he's still, He's still, uh, you know, he's kind of a, he's kind of an anti-hero almost. He's still a bit of a villain. He still clings to some, you know, uh, <laughs> shall we say unhealthy cultural opinions, you know, that, that were shared with, with, uh, you know, people at that time. Um, but like I said, he's, he's a good Vegeta to Mizu's Goku, I think. In, yes. In, uh, that's in a great, that's a great comparison. Yeah. So I, I liked his character a lot. And I liked the interaction between the two of them. I thought 
his little like quips here and there you know a lot of times i i really don't like you know random humorous one-liners here but they but they did it in a in the way the old the ot star wars trilogy did it right yeah where it was appropriate it was applicable applicable to the moment it wasn't forced and it was that character you know it was he was saying it because he's that character and that character would say that and you believe that that character would say that you know <laughs> It's like he's basically like Samurai O'Doyle rules, right? From like uh, Billy <laughs> Madison way back in the day, you know? So it's a, uh, I, I really love that character and, and I hope we get a lot more Tyke in, uh, in, in future seasons. Falcon's dive. Not bad. You've been training. Tygen. Also, you know what what I liked about this again, a lot of this show is just stolen from other things, but we get the the Mulan moment in this show too, which is that clearly like the whole pretending to be a man and a soldier thing. Yeah. It's been done a million times, but th th when I talk about the Mulan moment, I mean specifically that her commanding officer, Lee Shang at some points, I mean, it's not explicit because they're not going to do this in a kid's movie starts to question his own sexuality. He's like, am I gay for this male character who's actually a woman, right? Uh, and you get that sense by the end of the show, especially when they're back uh, recuperating from their injuries at Fowler's Castle, and they're kind of wrestling. Like, there is some yeah. sexual tension there that is obviously not confusing to Mizu in the same way that it is not confusing to Mulan in Mulan, but it is probably uh. deeply confusing to... <laughs> to uh, Tygen as it was to Li Shang in Mulan. And yeah. I think those moments are just so fabulous. <laughs> you think you can take me down twice? Like, it, you know, because well, it, it does set up, you know, there's a, there's a really fun narrative that's going on here where Mizu is struggling from her former betrayal with a man that she loved. And she knows that Tygen is obsessed with Akemi and is trying to kill her because she disrupted his marriage to Akemi. And yet she is still attracted to him and he is quite clearly also confusingly attracted to her. So we actually have a great, like very believable love triangle happening in this situation yeah. as well. You know, and also at the, at the very end, Akemi essentially betrays Tygen, right? Where, uh, where, you know, he's like, great, we can finally be together. And she's like, no, I want to stick around and, and, uh, you know, try to kind of rule things. And I want power. He's like, at the end, the guy, because Tygen's whole thing, he's like, I need to restore my honor. I, I came from nothing. I need to, like, be an important person. At the end, he's like, I don't need to be important. I just want you. I just want a happy life. And she's like, I want power. And so they kind of they kind of split at the end, you know? I, they kind of go I think, opposite directions. But that's why we see such great character development, because we, we talked about right, Mises' yeah. character development. We talked about Tygen. But let's talk about Akemi, who went from this spoiled lord's daughter, um who was going to get what she wanted until Tygen lost the duel with Mizu, which took away Tygen's honor, and therefore he wasn't a suitable match anymore. So then she gets set up with the son of the Shogun. And I, I, what I loved is, again, the characters in this series are so good. Like, when she runs away and pretends to be a prostitute, right, the, the madam of the weird brothel for people with strange kinks which by the way is great like what a great concept the, uh, and like the octopi <laughs> you know well everyone's seen that that what, what is it wood carving paint ink, ink painting you know the the famous one yes from, from back the in wood, the day the wood block know? print um exactly yes. yeah <laughs> i couldn't remember which medium it was but we remember the octopus that's right <laughs> so but yeah that yeah Ma madam kaji who is the 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 madam of the the weird kinky brothel where that she goes to because she's she's trying to you know find Tygen basically I'm not gonna get into why she's a, trying to be a whore to find Tygen but it's, you'll it's watch where my the show. brain it's where my brain thought of the word poetry gasm for the first time I never connected those two words before but it's, we are. it's great that scene is great so you know but the the madam like basically schools her in reality right which mm -hmm. is to say. Yeah, shit sucks if you want to be a woman, but think about the amount of soft power that you can have. And I think that she really wakes up to that situation 
uh, at the end, the combination of Seiki, her her father's advisor, who basically raised her and is a you know a godfather figure to her, and mm. um, and uh, Madame Kaji basically force her to realize that by the end of the show, she is in an incredibly powerful situation. So first off, the shogun is dead, which means that her husband now has a bunch of power. Her husband mm. is mentally weak and easily controlled so she can be the power behind Seems the like throne. a nice guy at least oh yeah he does seem like he a nice guy like earth, but, but but yeah she <laughs> she's she's basically the power behind the throne now if she wants to be and on top of that her father was part of the conspiracy she knows this and so her father who has been you know dominating her and forcing her to live her life she is now basically in control of his fate as well. So suddenly she is thrust into a scenario because of the chaos that is unfolded around the assassination of the Shogun into the most powerful person in Japan. And she realizes that she should not throw this away to be with Taigen um, and instead takes the advice of people like Madame Kaji and Seki to be, be the power behind the throne. Stop running to and from men and decide what you want for your fucking self. I want to be in control of my life. Then take control of his princess. And I think that that realization is makes her is going to make her such a fucking interesting like intrigue character moving forward because we got yeah. to see the evolution from kind of silly princess who's she's smart she's a smart silly princess but it's been her um kind of like foray out into the world that has given her yeah. wisdom to go along with her intelligence and now she's going to start playing you know court games and court intrigue uh, especially against her husband's mother um, and that's going to be, I, I think, a very interesting, a very interesting plot line. It's uh, she's she's our our Daenerys Targaryen, right? Where <laughs> she was married off to the this guy, learned how to you know control the dynamics in their relationship, and then uh, you know through that relationship came to power. And so it's you know again nothing we haven't seen before, but it was you know it was done in an intriguing way, right? Where it sort of takes that that naive princess and and has her go through a lot of stuff that uh, turns her into you know more you know well rounded you know well developed character right. Turns out when you take time to you know develop your characters, you could get good characters. Who knew? Shocking. Who knew? Right? Yeah, this is such a revolutionary thing. Yeah, it doesn't exist at all on the Disney Plus website. Sorry. Well, except for Andor. Never mind. I take that back. Andor has good character development. Ah, Disney Plus. You've just you've got Andor. <laughs> you've got Andor saving you. That's I, it. I it's it's absolutely crazy to me too because um you know, Disney Plus is commissioning shows that are of equivalent length to this show, but the the amount it goes to show the importance of good writing, right? Because the amount better written that this show is than most other shows that we've watched or that are even out there right now is is extraordinary. Like this is yeah. this is a very well planned out narrative and it's a very well planned out show and it holds up just incredibly well. Yeah. That's uh I I talked a little bit earlier about the how I didn't like the modern music being inserted here and there. The rest of the music I really liked. Um, it just, it was very subtle. It uh, pushed the scenes along really well. Um, there was a reoccurring theme that was, you know, kind of moving and, and good to hear. So again, like I, I didn't like the modern stuff that was thrown in, but the rest of it I thought I thought was great. Keep that, ditch the modern stuff for season two. I also think we just have to talk about the action sequences because they are oh, yeah. super creative, incredibly fun good. to watch. The choreography is amazing. You really get to, f they feel epic in scope and mm -hmm. it does have the, you know, the kind of classic anime or like John Wick style, like John Wick is clearly an inspiration for this as well. Right. Uh, in terms of like the stylish action sequences with the one man army and kind of the the kooky villains that you encounter along the way, mm -hmm. like the giant with the Tetsubo who's trying to smash her while they play Metallica, you know, for example. Yeah, well, you go back to like, you know, again, like Kill Bill's a good example of this Dick Tracy, even, you know, back, back in the day. There's been a lot of stuff where it's like 
it's it's uh set in real life there's there's technically no fantasy elements you know in the series but everything is just a little bit bigger than life in the right way to make it feel yeah. more epic and this is a, another example of a show that does that really well where the big people are just a little bit bigger than you would you know reasonably see the action is just a little bit more fantastic and agile than you would reasonably see so but it's it's not fantasy but it definitely pushes the bounds of reality you know yeah, and it's not, a, you know, there's just enough combat. Uh, this isn't like those 90s anime films that are mostly just gratuitous battle. Like, it has very cool sequences, but most of the show is character development. It is dialogue, and it's not, you know, it's a lot of walking around and traveling from place to place and characters having conversations with each other that's interspersed with, with what feels like the precise right amount of action. Yeah, right? it, it. I never felt... I want more action. And I also never felt, oh, these action sequences are going on too long or that they are too similar to what has happened previously within the show. Like, for example, you know, when she fights the school, she's in the school battling her way to the master. Um, that feels very different than when she fights the four fangs, which feels very different from when she invades the castle and is going through all the traps and is getting, you know, hypnotized by hallucinogenic flowers held by monkeys. Like it's like really <laughs> crazy. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that happens in this show, but yeah. each combat sequence is very weighty and very unique in and of itself. Yeah. I, I love it when uh, a show or a movie isn't afraid to keep the action to only scenes that require action. You know, it doesn't put it in, just for the sake of having, you know, another big punchy fight, you know, like we see in a lot of the, the Marvel stuff, right? Or another lightsaber duel, like we see in a lot of the Star Wars. Like, yes, we love big punchy fights. Yes, we love lightsaber duels, but they need to have meaning behind them to be, you know, worth watching. Otherwise, you're just sort of sitting through it, right? Well, and, and you know, again, the choreography does play into this too. And, and the choreography, like you said, is, is very good. The animation was great. Uh, when I was watching some of the stuff, I was like, holy cow, like somebody had to actually like, you know, animate all of this. Like this is, it was very impressive. I wonder if they did use some uh, motion capture for some of it. Um, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of times they will, you know, um, which isn't cheating at all. I mean, oh. uh, when Disney made movies in the eighties and nineties, they would, you know, shoot footage of people doing yes. actions and then essentially, you know, just use that as a reference directly for their action movies. So, you know, essentially motion capture has been used for decades and decades yes. in animation already, Obviously. right? <laughs> um, but the, the choreography was was extremely good. And the way they move the camera around that space was very good, too. You need, I think you need someone who thinks in a very... Uh, very creative particular way to be able to go into a virtual world uh, as a virtual camera person and move the camera in a way that both, you know, contains, that, that both shows off the speed, the power of the action, but also not in a way that's just disorienting, you know? So the the virtual camera work that happens in this, in this show is extremely good too, around the choreography. Yeah. And I also love when you get a good sense of anticipation about a fight, Doa, because it's not like yeah. every fight in this show is there, there's a there's a sense of it's coming up, right? You don't just get a random fight, really, that's happening. It's like, so, for example, when she goes to the school, like, you know, you know, they had already introduced Tygen and you know that the fight is heading in that direction and you kind of get the anticipation of what she's going to do. Or when they when Fowler dispatches the four fangs to deal with her, it's not that the fight happens immediately. They have to spend a while like finding her first. But it's like, yeah. you know, that fight is coming. And so you're just like, "Ooh, I'm anticipating when it's going to happen. And it feels a lot more epic as a result when she's fighting the 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 crime boss and his thousand claws in the brothel like that's interesting introduced earlier and there's an entire subplot where she has to assassinate somebody inside his his uh his headquarters that leads mm. into oh she's actually going to fight this entire army of the thousand claws when she you know that ultimately she's going to go to the castle but it takes several episodes for her to get to the castle and start the sequence um of you know entering it and you know she's going to fight fowler for the whole series so like mm. e the payoff just feels so good for these fights because they do such a good job of like leading into it over time and not like ambushing you with a bunch of random action you know the action is coming so you're really excited when it finally happens right yeah i mean everybody loves it when the beat drops 
in a, right. in a song, right? <laughs> but the reason they love it so much is because there's such a great buildup to the beat dropping. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's there's a lot of similarities between a rave and like this show, you know, or a lot of or like you know again like DBZ, you know, you look at Dragon Ball and there's lots of lead ups to those fights too. The fights end up taking like 30 episodes, so there's you know there's something to say there, but. Um, this does a good job of, yeah, lead up and then like suddenly the fight's happening and you're like, sweet, okay, this is what I this is what I was looking forward to. Now it's happening. Now we just get to enjoy it. The beat was dropped and the beat down was <laughs> dropped as well, begun. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, also, I think we do have to touch on the non-Kenneth Branagh actors because this show is actually just full of really great oh, actors. Yeah. George Takai, Ming-Na yeah. Wen, uh, you know, two of my favorites right there. I mean, it's uh, you've got, um, oh, the guy who, who was in Heroes way back when, Mas, right. Masayoka, yeah, yes. who plays Ringo. Who's um, great, the voice by the way. Acting, by the way, just, just oh, as an yeah. aside. Voice acting in general is great. Yeah. We didn't even talk about this George much Kane. beyond you saying like the 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 quips from Tygen. But mm -hmm. the the comic relief of this show is really good, either through Ringo, who's the kind of bumbling um, assistant who is born mm -hmm. without hands. So he's also, you know, I think that there's a really cool parallel between uh, the perception of Mizu as deformed from being half white with a with a mm -hmm. character who um, is born with birth defects and is trying to overcome them and, and you know, prove his worth. Uh, and then, you know, it, he is just very funny. A lot of the time, yeah. like his whole like I actually love the kind of stealth like the the slapstick bits where he's so stealthy despite being huge, where she has to tie the bell on him because even she can't hear him uh, coming, which I think is like a very fun attribute for that character to have, because clearly that's going to be played into for the rest of the show. Right. Like his stealth yeah. and the fact that, you know, he'll just show up and do something very useful and just say, see, useful. Because uh, he's trying to, and you know, prove his utility. It's very fun and like endearing and and funny. Mm. Sorry, stealthy. You do that a lot. Yeah, and I mean, it re it reminded me a lot of like the humor you would see in like Avatar: The Last Airbender, right? Ah, Where that's it's, true. Yeah, there there was a bit of slapstick in there. There was the quips and everything like that. But they established these characters as characters who would do that. And the situations they did that stuff in were, you know, realistically portrayed, right? It's the same reason that, you know, Han Solo works again, you know, in Star Wars, right? Or C-3PO's humor works in the, the original trilogy uh, was that it was all context appropriate, right? And it was character appropriate. So I think they they did a very good job of, of that. It's so nice to see humor done yeah. well in a serious show. It's so rare. And, the you know, it's so... It's so nice when people realize that you don't need to force it and you don't need to have humor, but you, you know, if your character would do something humorous here, just let them, you know, uh, that that's really it is, is know your characters, know what they would do and let them do it. You know, it's, and uh, it's so, it's so refreshing to see a show do that well. <laughs> and I was, I was really surprised at how good Maya Erskine was as Mizu, yeah. because what I've seen her in was Pen 15, which is a <laughs> oh, comedy wait. show. Oh, OK. I, I was not familiar with her work before the show. So, yeah. So she is she's in basically a show that she created with another woman. That's them playing themselves as like awkward 13 year olds. So <laughs> it's two adult women pretending that they are, uh, you know, like thir 13 or 14 year olds and just being okay. awkward middle schoolers. And the show is very, very funny and it's very well done. Um. And it's it's supposed to be like based off of their real lives, right? Um, but I did not expect her to play a dramatic role this well after having seen that. Like basically, because the only thing I've seen her in is her pretending to be a thirteen year old version of herself and being like the peak of middle school awkwardness to see her playing, you know, a very masculine uh, badass warrior woman was shocking. But I think the casting was really good, and I think she does an amazing job in the show. Yeah, I mean, having good casting is uh is is important, you know. It takes a, I I really I really would love to just talk to a casting director at some point and and you know, learn about how they do their craft because when you see things like that where it's not the first person you'd pick but they end up kind of being perfect, it's like how do people see that, you know? I'm not that that's not my job. So I I don't know exactly how you discover people like that, but I'd love to talk to someone who is good at that and kind of find out how that <laughs> happens because it is it is always interesting. Yeah, but I th I thought everybody was just 
Uh, all the all the voice acting was really good. It's super fun to hear George Takei just because his voice is so iconic. And I think he's just cast incredibly well as kind of the wise godfather character to Akemi. Akemi is is great in this. I, it's just there wasn't a bad person within this show. Like the characters are great. The actors were great. The action is great. The animation is great. The writing is great. I mean, this is just a fucking great show. And like, I think we can nitpick about some of the choices that they made. Like you said about, well, maybe and we should. it's a, it's a little job. weird. You know, I agree with you about just like taking off for London or wherever they're going. It is unspecified. It's just Im implied that it's London yeah. at the end of the show. And like, How would she keep Fowler Japan alive? How do you get how do you sail from Japan to London? That's what that's what I was wondering. They must be going, I guess they're going to China and then they're gonna go over land or something like that. Possibly. I mean, I, you'd have or to go you around go... you'd have to go around Africa, right? That would it, during that right. time period, um, because this circumnavigating through the Pacific would have been very difficult. You assume that the you know, most of the trade routes went south around um, you know, the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and it, well, there's the, there was what the Silk Road theoretically. Sure. Um, you could do so it over land too. It's, over land, yeah. It's still um, easier, I think, during this time period to go via Africa. It's faster too. Yeah, go around India, then down around the Horn of Africa, and then back up again. That's uh, I yeah. played a, a game on Commodore 64 back in the late <laughs> 80s, just to give you a clue at how old I am. The, called Sea Route to India, where you were trying to you were trying to basically uh, you know command a voyage that was going from Portugal to to India, and uh, you had to like you know maintain the crew's happiness and their food and all this kind of stuff, and and so yeah, so I know about that route from that game. <laughs> See, video games are educational. What can I say? Yeah, very very good. Um, so anyway, so, it's, so it's anyway, a great show. And like, I don't know if there's like, a lot more I, to say, but yeah. I, I think we can argue about some of the musical choices during the fight sequences as as like kind sure. of jarring. But I, you know what? I respect the fuck out of them for making a bold decision about that. Like that is a really specific decision that they made about how they wanted to present the soundtrack of this show. Um, yeah. And while I agree, it didn't decision. really it, it didn't really jive with me. Um, it, it was, it was an interesting decision and one that we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, like I said, I hope they make less interesting decisions about the music <laughs> in the future and just go with the, go with the more classical soundtrack because it sounded great. Um, but you know, again, my problems with the show are, are nitpicky, right? And, and I feel like I have to, I feel like I'm obligated to bring it up. You know, I am critiquing this, right? Um, but, but overall, I, I really, really liked it. Um, we I we haven't you know we haven't really used a rating system in a long time. We rated something right. We've we always tried to create some sort of like creative rating system. So I would say out of a, a hundred uh, dead uh, claw members, claw gang members, how, what would you give this? Well, it's a thousand claws, so it has to be out of oh, a, thousand. a thousand. Yeah. Well, I didn't see her kill a, a thousand. I saw her kill maybe a hundred. <laughs> they were just called so the thousand that's, claws. That's what I was so. Okay, I, out of a thousand dead claw members, how many dead claw members would you give this show? I fucking love this show. I'll be honest, like I was so I was intrigued by it, but concerned with how derivative it was at first. But it really took all of the ingredients that it was cooking with and turned it into something that was entirely different to what I've seen before. Yeah. Um, it's a great fucking stew and it is a stew full of random bits. But the end result of putting them all in the pot is fabulous. It's just really yeah. good. I would say, honestly, like 950 out of a thousand. I mean, I wanted to watch more of this series. I was like, fuck, I'm so sad that you this do. has ended because I just want to see more. I love where the story's going. I love the character development that we've had. It is it is probably one of the best shows I've seen in years. I haven't binged a series this quickly since like the last season of Cobra Kai. Like it's, uh, you know, it's very <laughs> rare where I, I will watch like three episodes of something in a row, you know, and, and I, so I burned through this show so fast and, and, it was it was just you know it was great it was that good, uh, but you didn't give me a rating though you didn't Nine, give me nine hundred fifty out of a thousand nine hundred fifty oh okay all right uh, I you know I that was going to be my rating actually because I thought that was uh, that was about as high as as I could go you know again the musical kind of stuff too I was expecting you to rate it higher I was expecting like a nine seventy five <laughs> or something like that I'll I'll give it. Uh, I'll give it a 949. Oh, there you uh, go. Because I felt like I was complaining a little bit more about some of the some of the you know finer it, story. It bothered you more than it did me. That's fair. It did. Um, so, but not not a ton. 949 dead uh, thousand claw uh, <laughs> brutes soldiers. You know uh, whatever you want to call them, gang members out of a thousand. So high marks either way. 
Very good. All right. Well, uh, we'll be back and we'll see you next week.